Welcome to Santa's house and this week's poll of the early morning Sunday show with Santa. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. It's another early morning Sunday show. God, I've been saying that for toward three years. Here is your host, Cat. Cat is here. Say meow, Cat. Not even gonna say meow to you today. All right, have a seat. Okay, one seat, pet. Yep. Okay. All right. Okay, sometimes you have to pet the host, you know, you have to kind of get them feeling good. So, cat's settling in, we're ready, yep, all right, meow, 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 okay. How's everyone? I'm great, thanks for asking. Down in uh, Cleveland this week, stayed downtown Cleveland, um, beautiful hotel, Weston, oh nice down there. It's just, it's still, oh my goodness, so many places not open, so many restaurants still not, you know, they tried, but then things locked down, so quiet, so, you know, you kind of, you go down, you're going to eat, it's fun to sit at the bar because you get to talk more with the bartender, find what's going on, and rough spot, rough spot for these folks um, but that's everywhere in the world isn't it you know and you know all, all, all of you from all over the world you know where you're at not easy right now but you do what you can do I did get a book read I mean I read this all this week Siren Song this is the autobiography by Seymour Stein very good uh, quick read it really it's only about was it, 300 pages or something yeah about 300 pages but it reads really fast and very interesting uh, it gives you really good insight into Sire Records but also into Seymour Stein I just remember when I was in college in the uh, late 70s into the 80s the record label that I found to be cool was Sire Records because Talking Heads which was the band that just blew me away when um, they came out, their second album was on there. I know the Ramones were on there, but that was kind of before me. But then the, the Pretenders, of course, um, eventually Madonna, Lou Reed, uh, just so many great. I mean, the guy had an ear. He wasn't a musician, but he knew how to go find people, and he hustled, and he helped the Coke industry big time. Great read. If you see that out there, Siren Song by Seymour Stein. Well worth getting it. Loved it. T shirt this week. Look at that. Okay, it's okay. It's okay, Cat. I'm showing the t shirt. He wants to go up. He didn't see this t shirt. Uh, Burning River, it's called. Is that neat? Uh, it's, 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 um, uh, a Cleveland shirt. Uh, Burning River was all, all the industry that they had in Cleveland, you know, at the, turn of the 20th century they had all the, the the steel mills all the auto everything there was so much pollution going into the river it burned it would be on fire so got a skeleton surfing there i just thought that was pretty darn cool and today's mug is sponsored by you may not be able to say it, the cleveland bone boneyard no the bone cleveland the bone yeah it's a Cleveland Memento Week. You never know. You know, if you want to have a new year coming up, you may get a new area. So give me some Cleveland Mementos. Hopefully not. I like Cleveland. It's okay. All right, we got a lot to show. Man, oh man, oh man. Um, I was going to show you some old friends. Forgot to get them lined up. I brought in, you know, back in some albums that um, I've lost but were really important. My top 100. But let's begin here. We talked about Sire Records. Sire Records in the late 80s signed Lou Reed. Um, really, they didn't. The big wigs didn't want him, but um, Seymour got him signed. And Lou Reed produced three of his greatest albums. In my opinion, he did Songs for Trello, New York, and Magic and Loss. Magic and Loss is the one we'll talk about. That's from Record Store Day. New York was really, this was, you know, I, I love Velvet Underground by now. Um, but, yeah, and Lou Reed, you know, there was some stuff I was buying, you know, his, you know, uh, Walk on the Wild Side and stuff. But New York was one that made me sit up, take notice, and became an all-time favorite album. Songs for Jello with John Cale. Just 
one of my top albums of all time. And I was glad they reissued that. I lost, well, I think I have the vinyl of my OG, but that's all I got left. But Magic and Loss. So this was his third one. This came out in uh, 1993. He had recently lost a couple friends to cancer. And it affected him. It affected him a lot. And he's getting older. So he wrote on here his 14 songs. And the 14 songs deals with illness. It deals with um, mortality. Uh, the, these are songs of fear and helplessness, but also of bravery with a little bit of humor. And, and the whole premise is you cannot have the magic of life without having loss. And so this is a dark album, but uh, the, some of the guitar playing uh, on here, what's good, is just, uh, it just has this neat, cool, groovy beat to it. There's a song called Gas and Stoked, which is, it, it is a guitar, a classic Lou Reed guitar workout. Uh, sort of damn you please. I just it's it's ingrained in my head. I love that song so much. I had only had this on CD before, so to see it on record store day was extremely exciting. Uh, lyric sheets in there, which is nice. It is to me this was and it's on you know the Sire label. The last really great. Lou Reed. I mean, he he's done. He, he did some other good stuff. This was the this is the last of the Sire trilogy that I feel my opinion was the peak of Lou Reed. Really neat. Hey, by the way, um, I got banned again on this album. <laughs> some of my samples banned in North Korea, Syria, Iran, Cuba. I am just becoming just a pain in their side. I <laughs> have this subversive channel. All right, we got, let's show this one. This um, from, um, from um, Music on Vinyl, Paul Rogers, Muddy Water Blues. This is a limited edition of 2000. I have to see that. Number 57. Isn't that fun? Number Seven almost made the top 50. I bought this. This came out in 93. I remember buying the CD and I wasn't impressed. It's it, I played it a couple of times and it sat on the shelf ever since. You go, why the hell did you buy this? Well, I'll tell you why. Okay, so Paul Rogers, bad company, right? Free. Uh, this is the second solo album. And he went and took a bunch of blues classics and kind of gave them a more rock feel. And he brought in some guitars. And we're talking big time guitarists to help him out with this album. Uh, he also had Jason Bonham brought in uh, to play the drums. The very first song, Muddy Waters Blues, which is acoustic, is the only song that he wrote. The rest, and it's a two album set, CD one, you know, but um, were just blues classics, ones that he chose. The problem I had with this is. I don't think Paul Rogers' voice is that good for these kind of blues. I think his voice his voice doesn't have the emotion that is needed. It doesn't have the rush, the, the rawness of a voice for the blues. But the guitar playing, we have Jeff Beck, David Gilmore, Buddy Guy, Brian Maeve, Steve Miller, Gary Moore, Trevor Rabin, Richie Sambora, Neil Sean, Brian Seltzer and Slash all give, all play guitar on here on different songs and do solos. The Gilmore ones, like, oh my God, David Gilmore, oh my God, there's his guitar. That is what made me buy this. I still don't like his voice on it. I like Paul Rogers' voice. I love the you know, way he did, you know, I, but I think Bad Company, I think Free. I don't think Down and Dirty Blues with his voice whatsoever. But that guitar playing, I rebought it, and I liked it better than I did in 1993. Oh, 30 years. You're, you, you can change your mind in 30 years, can't you? Your years change a little bit. There is this one. I found this down in Toledo. Stone Garden. Obviously, it's a repress. Stone Garden was a group formed in 66, and they lasted until 72. 
there was three brothers from Idaho. Idaho, hotbed of music. Name something else besides potatoes and Boise that come from Idaho. Yeah, right. Uh, some of you probably will give me a list of things. This, and so there's three brothers and a friend that did this. Pretty easy to tell the three brothers and the friend. Okay. It's furious. It's primitive. It's hard psychedelic. <laughs> it's some pretty cool stuff. You know, they originally, when they came out, they called themselves the Three Dimensions. Then they changed their name to the Knights of Sound with a K. Knights of Sound. And uh, then there, they saw the psychedelic poster. And on it, there was, you see, all these cool drawings. And there's the word Stone Guard. And you go, wow. That's what we're going to call ourselves. And they did. I believe their manager did that. So they, um, and that was in 67. They just changed their name to Stone Guard. Now, the three brothers were in high school at the time uh, when, they, when they were doing most of this. And there is some really good stuff. The thing is, as they began to graduate, they began to move on to something else. And so the group became a revolving door of different people. As someone would graduate and move on, uh, someone else would brought in. So they couldn't get the consistency within the group to get their sound down. Uh, so you have a lot of singles on here, uh, some stuff that was never heard. They did do a lot of touring in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, you know, I think it's 60s, Pacific Northwest was just a cradle of incredible garage-type music going on. There is the songs like The Ocean Inside Me and It's a Beautiful Day that are rocking, acid, fuzz, Guzzy guitars playing really, really good. But then you have something like um, The World is Coming to an End, I believe. Uh, yeah, uh, it was an early uh, single they made in 65, and the vocals are very weak. It kind of sucks. Uh, there's a song called Bastard, and and, and, and that one just starts out kind of weird and then just gets guitar heavy. So again, the songs, most of the songs were from 69 to 71. So just one of these reissues that come out now, looking at some bands that, you know what, that didn't make it, but put out a few things that might be of interest. There was a nice little sheet in here. Pictures. Stone Garden and what they did uh, for you for those of you that like psych rock that like that garage rock type sounds you would totally enjoy this album it, it was it was good I, re I really enjoyed it yeah I get some songs and eh, but what you're gonna that's what you're gonna get they didn't go anywhere you get a few great ones Some SCLT from a very a guy I consider a good friend and a wonderful channel, Belmoria. Belmoria is the name of the group. Uh, the album is called Clear Language. Belmoria uh, is the group of Michael Muller. His channel is noted in archive. It, it is an incredibly good channel. He also does Four Corners with Mazzy Michael 45 RPM. The man is um, just a fascinating person growing up. Uh, you know, his music, you know, started with more of the punk surf. And now it's in the neoclassical, uh, minimalism, really good. This is an album came out in 2017. And, you know, Bell Moria is, it's named after a town in Texas, I believe. It's a six-piece min minimalist band, uh, instrumental, out of Texas. Uh, Austin. Uh, they've just signed to um, the um, um, Dutch Gramophone label, as a matter of fact. So uh, it was formed by Michael Muller and by Rob Lowe, not the actor, please, in 2006. They have done seven albums. Their music is instrumental. Uh, 
but it's serene. And this, I mean, and, and this is such an incredibly beautiful, and, and serene is a good way to talk about it. There's like this sustained guitar and piano that's going on. Not flourishes, just a, a minimalist playing, but the notes hit at the right spot. And, and then you have these beautiful violins that, that come in and they work within that framework. And in the background, there's just this electronic ambient noise happening. It, it just, it works together so, so well. Uh, there is, what is it? Sky Could Undress. Yeah, Sky Sky Could Undress. It was a song. It, it, it was so, it, it was upbeat. I, it felt good. It was over and you just go, God, that was just, that was just wonderful. Uh, another song, Dreamt. Dreamy. Uh, yeah, Dreamt dreamy feel right okay you heard you can't feel that was coming but it was it's really nice dreamy feel with just these little just this nicely picked guitar playing um the album it's like it's like going to a peaceful garden in a hectic world and we all have those places where you want to escape and you want to get away from everything and that's what this is and it's just incredibly gorgeous ambient music um not ambient but it is neoclassical uh the, i mean the, the 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 new classicists part of that group out there when you think max richter and from and everything and it's music i love and this thing was wonderful so um clear language from belmoria uh, from 2017 couldn't recommend this one enough gorgeous it made me feel good michael thank you for sending that i i truly appreciate it <laughs> Uh, we have Plan 9, Frustration. This was some more SCLT. This came from Vinyl Richie. He sent this. Uh, and Frustration, this album came out in 1982. Garage Psych might be the best way to describe it. And there's four guitarists that play on here. Now, this was the first album. came out in 82. But it is... Um, there's, it's, it's all covers, so obviously it means there's no originals if it's all covers. But it's it's really fun stuff. I mean, it does. When you, you think how the Paisley Underground was taken off at that time, the resurgence of psychedelic rock, uh, these, these, these guys were part of it, and you have that feel. I don't know what their other albums were sound like, because they did eight albums, but I want to find out. You know, this was the first, so this is the first time I've heard about them. The vocals on it, they, they get a little washed out. It's, it's hard to hear at times. They kind of just get drowned out by the other music, the uh, frenzy that's going on. If you love 60s garage rock, this thing will check all your boxes. And just check, 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 check. check. Got it all. Love it. Got to have it. Uh, just really cool stuff. Uh, totally enjoyed this. What a neat group worth looking at i believe probably on bop records is where you can get that plan nine frustration <laughs> I'm going to show you what got me banned now in North Korea, Iran, Syria, and Cuba. Those four countries have a hard on for me. So far, I haven't lost my identity. Who knows? Here it is Orchestra Baoba. Baoba? 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 
It's named after a tree in Africa. Actually, you know, I can see that tree. I know what they're talking about. I just I can't say it. So, this music, that totalitarian regimes do not want you to hear, came from Senegal. Orchestra Baobab, <laughs> Baobab uh, was formed in 1970, broke up in 87, uh, reformed again in 01 when there was an interest in African music again. Uh, they're from Senegal. So the Senegalese. And between 70 and 87, they did 20 albums. 20. Hey, dude, I can't, I can't, it can't be all be about petting, okay? We're trying to talk here. Um, the host is really being pissy here. They, uh, they, they, they were the, the house band for club, or for, um, yeah, from the Baobab Club in Dakar. So, again, that's the name. They were the house band there, but they did do a lot of touring and going around. Uh, the music is in blacks. Okay, so M-B-A, M-B-A-L-A-X. That's how you, that's what the music's called. Now, I, you, you, you pronounce it. It's, it's not happening for me. It's a fusion of jazz, of soul, of Latin, of Congolese rumba. And of rock. How a lot of the African music that I have shown is has this funk, you know, it's Sly Stone, James Brown, Jimi Hendrix. That is not this. This is quieter. It is more relaxed. It has rhythmic rhythmic grooves. Nice. This is Analog Africa. They, uh, sometimes they give you a book. This time you didn't get a book. They just, maybe it's cheaper just to put it on the inner sleeves. Got a lot of nice pictures there. And there's a download code in there. Uh, but it's subtle. They have subtle metal vocals going. Uh, and they, they do a reworking of a number of Cuban songs. And when you hear it, you have the congas going. And it is this is a real... Caribbean Cuban type um, sound happening. There's there's a couple guitars, but there's only a sax player. This is not a horn band. Well, the sax does play in there, but it is more with this rhythm and the subtle guitars that are happening. It was something totally different. Yeah, you, know, you just you don't know what you're going to get as you go from each country. What really hurt this group is in eighties. Um, New bands were arriving, were coming out in um, Senegal that were more funk oriented. The big one was Yas Yasur Nadur, uh, which hit huge. I mean, even in the States, I, I had some of his CDs and kind of buried their sound. Another great one from Analog Africa. I was going to see when this one um, it says 2001, but I know it came out um, since then. But really nice music that totalitarian regimes around the world do not want you to see. favorite group. Uh, I'm trying to, hey, I might make it video. I have 10 records to show today, so I apologize. Uh, well, I don't apologize. It's my channel, right? Damn it. Endless Boogie. This is called Focus Level. This came out in 2008. It was their first full-length album. And it is on two albums. It is 79 minutes of music. This is a favorite group of mine. I love this group. It's like they take the best part of a blues jam and then they just keep bringing it back, going over and over and over again. It is boogie. They're called Endless Boogie for a reason, because the boogie goes on endlessly. And 79 minutes can be a little bit to take in all of it, in all honesty. It's a New York City quartet. They are a bunch of music nerds that just formed a group. They don't do this as their profession. They do it for fun. This is like a hobby.
you know, and it's like they just go out and gig. If someone asks them to, hey, maybe they'll come out. Uh, there, there is just this hypnotic groove that's going on. Just it's really it's hypnotic. There's dueling guitars, the 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 booming drums, the vocals. You get a lot of grunts and growls happening in there. It's not about the vocals. And, I mean, they're just kind of rough. I, I can't even understand what the hell he's saying. It is groove. All about the groove. And that's what I love about this group. Um, it's like a swamp driving vibe happening. I mean, it's swampy. It's dirty. Um, it's canned heat, shall we say. If canned heat just kept going with their groove again over and over and over i mean you get like two songs on the side here because they just they keep going so really neat i've been getting a lot you know i've been just slowly buying up their albums endless boogie from 2008 <laughs> My local store had some jazz come in. We don't get a lot of jazz here in Midland, Michigan, but look at this one. This is Bill Evans' trio. This is from 65. This is on Verb. Beautiful shape. Isn't that gorgeous? The vinyl is very good. I'm not going to say it's mint or anything. Um, on the Verb. Ah. If you haven't seen the Verb label before, there it is. Ooh, pretty cool, huh? So Bill Evans Live, 65. It's actually eight songs from eight different shows. And they just compiled them together. When you think Evans, in the 60s and 70s, he was probably one of the most influential pianists. And he appealed to the non-jazz as well as the jazz. And that really helped get him some notoriety. He fought heroin. He had those kind of problems, uh, but he, he he really knew how to make some wonderful music. In '59, he played on Kind of Blue, but he really didn't play for Miles Long. Actually, in '59, he formed his own trio, and on here he has Chuck Israel Is Israelis on bass, Larry Bunker on drums. Beautiful music. Really neat. When it's a trio, the focus uh, obviously goes on to the piano play. And so you can hear that. You know, bass and drum, they have their solos, but you can only do so much. It comes to the piano playing. It comes on how he wants to do the music and where he wants to bring it. He does a wonderful version on here of Round Midnight. And it's neat to hear this, you know, classic song, Round Midnight, done with a three-piece band. And to hear his piano take it into new directions. Uh, there is, there's, there's quiet songs on here, and there's little faster songs. This, this is just a really cool listen. Super good to get this beautiful, extremely nice little depress of this. Couldn't have been happier. <music> Around Midnight, he had this come in. This is an OG mono. So Around Midnight by Miles Davis. This was the first album he did from Columbia. Luckily, that tells me how to take care of your stylist, so that, that helps. This, look at the inner sleeve. It's just even in incredibly good condition. Columbia 6i. Really great shape. Whoever had these albums, took care of them, did really nice. So this was his first album he did for Columbia in 1956. And this really became, shall we say, the pace setter. 
this changed, put just put jazz, turned it upside down. Uh, we have uh, six songs on here that would become standards. These are songs from others. Miles took it. You know, you have Round Midnight, Bye Bye Blackbird, Dear Old Stockroom, Alucha. These these were all that ones that he played in concert again and again and again. Such important tunes came from this. Um, and uh, it just changed the way jazz was. You know, I, I used to have this. I had a nice OG stereo. It was wonderful to get now an OG mono. Beautiful shape. Round Midnight. One of those really important, beautiful jazz albums. Just beautiful. Not bop, really not hard bop. It's Miles. It's Miles 50s. All right. Wow. That, that went long. Um, Thank you, everyone, for watching. Really appreciate. Great having you here again this week. Uh, Christmas is almost here. Hope you're getting your shopping done. Enjoy, and we'll see you again. Bye.